Welcome back to another edition of Special Situations Investing with Greg. This week I'm going to be answering a question from one of the mutant investors out there. It was Daniel that asked me a great question a couple of weeks ago, and here's my answer to him. Check it out. Hey everyone, welcome back to another edition of my YouTube channel on Special Situations Investing through and my personal investing practice. As a quick disclaimer, this video is for educational purposes only. Any companies that I mention in this presentation are discussed solely for illustrative purposes. Discussing such companies and the specifics about them is to help educate me and educate you about certain special situations. It is not a solicitation to purchase them. I recommend that you conduct your own research and identify why you might want to own the company yourself prior to your committing of any funds. I also recommend that you seek the services of a financial advisor that has considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. And then finally, may your education here grow your knowledge, improve your personal investing performance, and give you the confidence to take control of your future. Thanks a bunch for watching. Now on to the video. A couple of weeks ago, Daniel asked the following question, and I think that it is one of the more valuable questions if you're trying to do investing in spin-offs. And I'm going to answer this question as best as I possibly can and give you an idea of what I think of when I go through the investing process on this. And it goes as follows. Daniel asks, I have been digging into Victoria's Secret Company as I am interested in the business since it's spin-off from L Brands. I've been digging through SEC filings, trying to ascertain what Victoria's Secret Company's management incentive structure is. I looked through the Form 10, but haven't really found what I'm looking for. Is there any, or is there a certain way you go about gauging or finding management's incentives or ownership after a spinoff via the SEC filings? Daniel, thanks again for asking that question. This is a great question to be asking. Well, let's dig in to the answer. All right, Daniel. So let's walk through how we how we do this. We're going to start here with the 10-12B. We're going to go here. You can read through it. We talked about that last week. But we're going to dig through to this spot right here, compensation discussion and analysis. So compensation discussion and analysis is where you can find the, the leaders of the company, of the new company that you're, you're getting into, and then also what it is that they are going to to invest in. So uh, I think it's important to, to spend some time getting to know the CEOs of the company. And so you have Martin Waters, Amy Hawk, and Gregory Eunice. Now, Stuart Bergdorfer and John Mihas, and I hope I didn't butcher their names too much, but uh, these are former chief CEOs of the company. And it says that they're, they're leaving in that time. But we have Mr. Waters, Ms. Hawk, and uh, Mr. Eunice. And so we can we can go into each of these and kind of get an idea of what it is. Now, what happens in this uh, filing, I think, I think is something that happens pretty often and pretty. It's a pretty common way to to learn about the compensation package for for a new company out of a spinoff. And in this case, L Brands, they came in and they said, "Hey, this is our compensation committee, and we're overseeing the compensation program based on the following clear and purposeful guiding principles." And they talk about the three things that they're looking at. They have their compensation component right here; it's their pay level, and then they uh, identify the principles that they want to approach with that. You know, they want competitively, equitably, and then they have a pay mix, and then they have pay for performance. And so, the the thing that that I'm looking for is something that emphasizes, in this case, performance contingent long-term equity compensation over fixed compensation. And so something that allows them to focus on their long-term equity as opposed to fixed compensation over time, okay? And then they also wanna recognize um, performance over time. And so the the great thing that Victoria's Secret did on, their, on, on this 10-12, is right here. They identify on each one of these that the going forward, they're going to share their compensation philosophy with all brands, and they identify that they'll design their Victoria's Secret compensation program with the same core guiding principles as apply under the uh, L Brands Executive Compensation Program. So basically, uh, probably out of simplicity, they're they're going to have a lot of the same corporate DNA 
in the way that they do their compensation plan. And so I would expect that the stuff that you're looking for here under L brand principles is going to be very similar to what you will see coming out of the Victoria's Secret program. They connect pay to performance. And so they're going to continue to do this. We will we will adopt LB's pay for performance philosophy and allocate a meaningful portion of its executive total direct compensation to at-risk components. Now, there's an interesting thing here. These two key elements of that, that they connect on their pay to performance. First, incentive goals are designed to challenge its executives to achieve a high level of performance to earn incentives at target levels. When executives hit and exceed or fall short of these goals, uh, L Brands compensates them accordingly. Second, they want to connect the pay performance to shareholder interest. L Brands employs a pay mix philosophy that places greater emphasis on performance-based and equity compensation over base salary. The governing practices, they kind of go through that. I didn't see anything that looked out of, out of the normal out of this. Uh, I thought that it was just kind of interesting to, to read through. And, and I found that this was a very interesting read um, <laughs> in general. The next thing that you that I found that was kind of important to look at is um, right here, this independent committee consultant. Now, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, they talk a lot about how uh, when you when you think about compensation committees, most of the time what happens is they have this compensation committee that is hired by a board that was put in place so that they could you know collect kind of a pension off of the company and. These compensation committees are usually there. They're just going to find something that allows for consistent raises for a management team. And this, every almost every company that you see out there will probably do that. I get that that isn't always the best thing. And if you listen to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger on this, they're like, "Come on, guys, you, you need to start thinking through how you're how you're approaching this." But um, yeah. Just expect that this is this is going to be pretty standard, and at least the position that I'm in, and the position that I would imagine most people that are watching my channel are in, you're not going to be in a situation where you can actually make a change to that. And even if you were on the board to make a change, it you still have to have a commanding vote of the board in order to make the difference. But most of the time, compensation committees. If they're a third party, they're going to find ways to continue to provide raises for the executives. Part of that is good because you want to make sure you're retaining good talent. The other part is not always that good because sometimes you you have the company uh, retaining talent that isn't performing well. So compensation comparison, pretty standard to have them. Um, if they're going to have a compensation committee like this, a you know, third party committee, they're going to go out there and they're going to find the open... Uh, the, the information out there about other uh, management teams and how much they get paid for what they do. And they say that they're going to do the exact same thing. And they actually, uh, in this case, they identify the list of the companies that they expect the, the compensation consultant to look at in order to make their comparisons. And so you, if you wanted to, you know, go very, very in-depth on this, you could dig down into each one of these companies' compensation plans, and you can kind of see how they might might use this in their peer group. The next thing that I think is important, and, and this kind of gets into the meat of what uh, I hope Daniel is looking for, and it's what I look for when I do my investing. And this is the compensation components. Um, these non-executive officers, that's what NEO stands for in this, they, they have these compensation components that they're, they're identifying that allow them to, to basically determine how much their compensation will be. And the going forward section is what I'm looking for is we anticipate continuing uh, L Brand's executive compensation mix, including that base salary, the short-term performance-based awards, and the long-term awards. As a new smaller company, we will evaluate our executive compensation mix to match the needs of Victoria's Secret. So they identify, hey, we're going to talk about base salary. And so they go back and they identify what kind of base salary their, their CEO had during 2020. And so Mr. Waters, he earned 
uh, just over a million dollars for his base salary, and then Miss Hawk, just under a million, and then Mr. Eunice, just a, uh, under 900000 850000 And then Mr. Bergdorfer and Mr. Mihas were both at $1.2 million each. And, and they say, once we're a separate company, we anticipate we will continue L Brand's base salary design for our NEOs. And so basically, they say the table does not reflect the fact that each of the executive officers' base pay was reduced 20% for approximately three months during 2020 in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, in February 2021, Mr. Waters' base salary was increased to $1.25 million in connection with his promotion to CEO of Victoria's Secret. So in this case, all of these uh, all of these indicate that they they did take a or they took a pay cut, but it, it's not reflected in this. And they're actually telling you that this is what we expect that their ongoing base salary will be, except for Mr. Waters, which is here at 1.25 million. So basically that's their base salary for now, uh, pending any raises that might have happened. Maybe that that is something that we could dig into and, and get it. But I'm not going to I, I'm not going to spend my time looking for a hundred thousand dollars with this. If they're earning about a million dollars, I'm just going to call it at a million dollars. I'm not going to spend my time pinching pennies on this one because I need to understand some of the bigger stuff because the question that Daniel was asking was more on how is management uh, incentives and that aligned with my interests as a shareholder. And that gets me to the second part, and that's the short-term performance cash, uh, performance-based cash incentive compensation. And this one I thought was really good. Most of the time when we, when we think about cash incentive compensation, they base it on sales or they base it on uh, some other item. The fact that they are ba basing this on operating uh, income is very very good. Now, the problem that I have is that this is on adjusted operating income. And the issue with saying adjusted operating income is this. You have adjusted operating income is not necessarily your actual operating income sometimes. So like if you look here, their adjusted operating income right here in for the fiscal year, year ended each year was totally different than their actual uh, operating income loss, okay? And so then you have to say, okay, well, what's the compensation then? They're saying that this is non-GAAP financial measures. So you have to get down here. Non-GAAP financial measures identifies what you're, we're looking at, their adjusted operating income. How did they get to that? Well, they took their GAAP amount, they did asset impairments, they had restructuring charges, and then they had uh, terminations in Hong Kong, and then their UK and Ireland joint venture establishment. And so basically they're, they're taking out, when they do their adjusted operating income, they're taking out the changes in business. And I, and I get that, this, this is definitely something that you have to be thinking about. The restructuring charges, you know what, I'm, I'm not gonna get after them for that. Um, the asset impairments, though, you know, if they're if they're adding that back in, then let's take a look at those asset impairments. That gets me really concerned that they're allowing that to be an issue because if an asset impairment comes out, basically it says, "Hey, you know what? The, this company is no longer, or this." this entity, this, this store is no longer making the money that we're expecting it to, then that tells me that they're, they can kind of dig into those numbers and, and change them to meet the criteria that makes it, makes it so that they get their short-term performance-based. Now, I'm not saying that that's what they do, and I'm not saying that that is uh, good or bad. I just want you to be aware that that's, that's what I'm looking at when I see those things. So, they established this. It's based on adjusted operating income. And more importantly, they, they dig into this a step further. They have two different seasons that they base this on. So they have their spring season and then their fall season. And if we look back at that adjusted operating income, in fiscal year uh, 20, 2020, for the year ended February 1st, 
it was 81 million. But if you look down here, they're saying their actual performance was negative 242 and then a positive 518. And so just off the top of my head, that's somewhere in the 260 range. Uh, so 260 million, but I'm seeing the total adjusted income, operating income to be around 100 million. Uh, to me, that that makes me say, okay, whoa, 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 what's going on here? How do we how do we get to that number? And why isn't that being uh, better put out here? And that that's the only issue that I've had with Victoria's Secret after digging through this was that little section that basically they're they're not very clear on how they came to these numbers, and I had a hard time uh, being able to replicate it. Maybe that's why Daniel was asking that they. They say that this is the, I mean, they give you the numbers here, but it still feels really, really, um, it's kind of sketchy to me when I have my executive compensation that is based on actual performance of a spring season that is not specifically identified in the, that, that goes along with, at the very least, gap accounting uh, timelines. Uh so digging down, digging down into this, that they have these operating income ranges, and and they have this that goes along with this, and they have a a threshold, a target, and a maximum. And so the threshold is loss of one hundred and fifty four percent of the of the operating goal is is how I'm reading that, and then the maximum is anything over that. And so basically. This performance between threshold and target and target and maximum is interpolated to determine the payout percentage at 20% for threshold performance up to a maximum of 200 times or 200% of maximum performance. So basically, as long as, as long as they don't lose more than 154% of their threshold amount, and as long as they, uh, if they go beyond maximum, they, they can get up to 200%, okay? So the payout percentage starts at 20%, goes up to that 200, and it's probably graduated as they go through that. The short-term performance-based cash incentive program compensation targets are set as a percentage of the base salary with the amount earned ranged from zero to double the target incentive based on the extent at which the financial goals are achieved or exceeded. Okay. And so I'm not saying that they're doing anything wrong here. It's just my 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 concern is is this was a little bit sketch on how how it is that they're saying this because it makes it difficult for me to understand. And um, again, it, when when I'm looking at spinoffs and I look at their SEC filings, usually the SEC filing in the way that it's written makes me feel very comfortable or very uncomfortable with the company. And and the way that Victoria's Secret, their management team, put this together except for that one little instance, everything else makes me feel very comfortable with the way that they're, they're conducting their management and incentive program. And then they, they have one other thing here. That this shows their fiscal incentive payout. And I, I think that this is important to see. You have Mr. Waters, you know, his target incentive is um, 1.8 million. But because they did so well in the fall, he got basically 2.5 million. Okay. And so the fiscal target, you know, each one of these guys, they, they, they did pretty well because fall 2020 actually had a pretty, pretty good, you know, roaring back, you know, people got their, their stimulus checks and started coming back and, and taking care of business and buying things. You can dig into this a little bit more if you want to, but I, I think really, they did a great job at just identifying this as the percentage of their fiscal target. So each of them, you know, they they performed, they overperformed what their their expectations were based on that. And then the last thing that I'm looking for is this long-term equity compensation. And I, this is the one that I usually spend most of my time on because this is the one that helps me see whether or not they are aligned with me. Now, uh they they dig into hey this is how we've done it i i think the the most important thing that you need to look at on this one daniel is these two sections right here this is on page 113 i think yeah 113 
and basically it says, in connection with his promotion to chief executive officer, Victoria's Secret Lingerie, Mr. Waters was granted RSUs with a grant value date of one million with Cliff Vest after one hundred at one hundred percent after three years. So Cliff vesting is when those restricted stock units are one hundred percent vested for him. He doesn't have like a graduated form. He just basically is staying there until the end of basically until November of 2023. And then that $1 million uh, restricted stock unit that he had, he, he then, he then has the value of those that's available for him to, to cash in if he wants to at that time. In addition, following the end of the fiscal 2020 in connection with his promotion to chief executive officer, Mr. Water is granted uh, uh, PSU. So, um, so PSUs again. These are these are performance stock based units, and this is with respect to his LB shares of common stock, with a target grant value of six point five million. So the PSUs will vest anywhere between fifty and one hundred and fifty percent of the target based on Victoria's Secret achievement of certain revenue growth and operating income metrics over a three year period performance period from January, 2021 to February, 2024. So it's subject to Mr. Waters being continued, continually employed up until that point in February of 2024, okay? And so they're not going to, they're going to adopt this, which means that they're going to have that. And then they're also going to adopt something similar to this plan under which they're going to grant equity incentive awards, PSUs, RSUs, and stock options to their senior executives including their non-executive officers, non-employee directors, and employees. The Victoria's Secret HHC Committee in consultation with compensation management will review performance metrics vesting in other terms. Okay, so basically you can see the, the performance incentive plan, but basically what I'm looking for is I want to see, I want to read through what they've already done, kind of get an idea of what it is, and then you can see the rest of the plan here. This is where they identify what their, um, what the purpose of their their vesting will be, and how they're going to attract their team. Let's see. Ah, right here. I usually like to look at the authorized shares. So the the twenty twenty one plan will be equal to twelve percent of the Victoria's common stock on a fully diluted basis as of the distribution there. So so basically they. They are allowing up to 12% of the Victoria's Secret common stock to be used for compensation. Now, um, to me, that's that's pretty important to to pay attention to because 12% of your total the the total equity value for Victoria's Secret is definitely uh, worth worth being aware of because then. On a diluted basis, you're basically thinking my share price could be 12%, could be diluted by that 12%. Okay. They haven't really given, they, they didn't, to me, they didn't give enough information to really make me feel like, like I knew exactly what it would be going forward, which is part of the issue why I've spent as much time on the back end of it. But that is pretty normal. Sometimes you'll see that. Sometimes you'll see better. Uh, clarity on that. Uh, sometimes you won't, and that that doesn't get me worked up one way or the other. You can also they also have this stock purchase plan, all these other things that go into it. But um, basically, to me, that that's a pretty decent uh, equity incentive program. They also had. Let's see. I think I saw one other thing that I I wanted to point out to you on them. Because I think that it's important to also know where they want us to be. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the other thing is here on page 116, the uh, encouragement of common stock ownership by L Brands covered executives through stock shop. Ownership guidelines promote long-term focus and performance, discourage inappropriate risk-taking, and align the interests of the executives to those of its shareholders. Stock ownership guidelines can be met through direct or beneficial ownership 
of LB L brand's common stock, including L brand's common stock held under its stock incentive and retirement plans. Okay, so this is their expectation that the chief CEO is required to achieve and maintain financial benefit, beneficial ownership of with a value of at least five times his base salary and uh, other covered are other covered executives are required to achieve and maintain an ownership of stock value three times the executive's base salary and so so basically they have this requirement they are going to go ahead and uh, i mean help them out by giving them vested option or vested uh, restricted stock units and performance based stock units and then going forward they intend to review and adopt stock ownership guidelines appropriate for Victoria's Secret as newly established standalone public company. So they might they might change these a little bit, but they they do have this expectation that they have um, on this. And then uh, the board of directors also needs to maintain ownership of at least the number of shares of um, LB's common stock received as a board compensation over the previous four years. So anyone on the board, anyone in the executive offices, they have a requirement or, uh, yeah, it is a requirement, at least here, because they're using required and must for the for ownership and beneficial ownership for a significant portion number of the shares outstanding. And so basically they have this requirement to have that for, um, for stock ownership. Now, okay, that's fine. All well and good. I've identified that they have a decent stock incentive plan. It looks like it's going in their favor. Most of the time when you read through this, you're going to see that most of the uh, incentive structure is very, very good. But the other, uh, it's very, very good. And it's also uh, in favor of the CEO and the executive committee or executive team. The, the other thing though, is you want to look at this They've given us a number on these stock ownership guidelines that I, I definitely want to look into. And so in this case, let's take a look at Martin Waters. And he has this net worth. And you can go to Walmine. You could, you, basically, you can just go to Google and just type in the name of the executive officer that you're trying to look up. And then you type in net worth. And you should be able to – most likely you'll come to Walmine because they, they do this specifically – but it just says, hey, this is how many shares he has of L brand stock. And so you'll have to take the, the comparison of how many shares he received or would have received out of L brands and then convert that over into your Victoria's Secret stuff. Because if that's, if that's what you're going to approach. And then you say, oh, okay, his net worth, uh, it, the worth of that stock is $25 million. His total net worth is 33 million. That's the number that I'm looking for. That ratio between their total net worth and their and their uh, stock ownership net worth. And so in this case, over half of his net worth is tied up in this company's share prices. That tells me he's not going to do crazy things. That's going to make it so that he's going to lose that money anytime soon. Same thing with Amy Hawk. She has 10 million, and right now her Current share or stock price or stock ownership is about seven and a half million. Now, this one is a little bit low, as well as um, Mr. Yunus. Well, let me bring this in a little bit so you guys can see that a little bit better. So, Mr. Un Greg Yunus, he goes in here. He has eight point five million, and he has eight point one million in in stock compensation. So, you know, you dig back into these total annual compensation that they had in in 2020 you know so he has martin waters has compensation of almost four million dollars and his net worth out of the share prices is 25 million so he's he's pretty darn close to that that uh, that threshold and then amy hawk she has 7.5 million and uh, but she earned uh, just under three million so technically you know, as as the pink executive officer, she should probably be closer to about nine million. And same thing with with Gregory Eunice. He's he's pretty darn close to that as well, but he has about eight million. And so uh, that's the 
that's the thing that I'm looking for when I see this. I want to see a chief executive officer and the secondary officers that they're that they're giving executive compensation to. I want to see them specifically identify that they have a significant portion of their net worth in the company. And most of the time when you're thinking about alignment, that's what you're going to be looking for. Thanks again, Daniel, for asking that question. Uh, after I looked into Victoria's Secret, if I was looking at just the management section of this, I would definitely say that that was the, the amount of the net worth of each of the executive officers that they have that are going over to Victoria's Secret, to me, looks like they are they are in a position that their incentives would be aligned with your own expectations. And so I would expect that those three should do a, re a reasonably good job at at protecting your interests or having your interests at heart when you're when you're investing with this company. Um, in full disclosure, I haven't invested in uh, Victoria's Secret myself. I have all of my money in different things that I've talked about in this uh, YouTube channel. I'm still waiting for some of those things to pan out at this moment. But uh, Daniel, thanks a bunch for asking this question. Probably one of the more interesting things that I was able to dig into. And I hope I answered the question to your expectation. For everyone that was watching, if you like having videos where I, I dig into the reason why I do some of the things that I do, please hit that like button. And if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe. It, those two things, because I'm doing this for free, allow me to continue to find the stuff that is of use and useful to you. And thanks a bunch for watching. We'll catch you next week.